This is frightening. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today. In our lead story today, the biggest threat to the American worker is coming, and even sooner than you think, because we continue to hear from political elites and central planners that the U.S. labor market is strong and robust. And over the holiday season, consumers went out and bought on that narrative, believing their job was safe and secure. And when you see what is coming this year, it's going to be outright frightening, and the damage it's going to do to the U.S. economy will be unrepairable. Now let's head over to Bloomberg, where we picked today's story up with that line. Fed's Barkin says soft landing looks more likely, but not inevitable, as central bankers, he says, are making real progress on inflation. And this is exactly what they believe. If they bring demand down in the form of inflation and the labor market holds up, that they win. And not just win, it's for the first time in history, because we can go back and look at central banking over the decades, and we can find that there's not one bit of evidence that they have ever nailed a soft landing. But today, what do we see is people piled into the U.S. equity market. They've been out spending on their credit cards, the buy now, pay later loans, all on the belief that the labor market is going to hold strong. But as you'll soon see, there's no chance at all. A soft landing is increasingly conceivable, he says, but in no way inevitable. And Barkin is voting on policy decisions this year, making anything he says very important as we come up to the next FOMC meeting. Demand, employment, and inflation all surged, he said, but now seem to be on a path back to normal, which is true. The problem is what he doesn't realize is that normal employment, unemployment is actually higher than its current level. In fact, if it continues to go up, it's going to have a damaging effect on the U.S. economy, one that will send us deep into a recession. Embarking to find a soft landing as inflation returning to normal levels while the economy stays healthy. Notably, he doesn't decide what healthy is. He leaves that up to interpretation. As he said, inflation is coming into the range of our 2% target. And six-month core inflation, which excludes food and energy prices, is running slightly below target. And of course, what we know they mean by healthy economy is one, that you don't lose your job, or at least, well, not that many people lose their job. The problem, as we get into what happened in the news today, you're going to see that the worst case scenario for the U.S. worker is indeed coming this year. And while Barkin acknowledged that most officials are expecting cuts in 2024, he said that conviction on both questions of inflation continuing its descent and the broader economy's performance will, quote, determine the pace and timing of any changes in rates. Of course, what we have noted on the show, inflation is indeed coming down because demand is coming down. And of course, there's absolutely no correlation to the federal funds rate and the consumer price index, despite what the central elites want us to believe. In the end of the day, they're going to be lowering rates, and not just once or twice like they think they are. Once the path down starts, it's going to accelerate in a big way, as you'll see, on its way to zero. The Richmond Fed president laid out several risks for the economy this year in his remarks at the Raleigh Chamber, North Carolina, including how a recent plunge in long-term interest rates could stimulate too much demand and keep inflation elevated. And many of you ask and make comments and say, Steve, these people are the experts. They are the central bankers. They know everything. And yet you continue to say that they are completely clueless. Well, I want you to see, let's go back and look at what he says. I want to provide you the evidence. He said a recent plunge in long-term interest rates could stimulate too much demand and keep inflation elevated. And what he's suggesting here is that as rates go down, people are going to consume even more. But there's one easy way to prove that this isn't true at all, because Barkin doesn't understand that a decline in long-term interest rates means growth and inflation expectations are headed down. It doesn't mean it's stimulus to the economy. And here you can see in this chart, the consumer price index in blue, this shown on a year over year rate of change against, of course, the 30 year treasury yield. And what we should see then, if he is correct, is that when the 30 year treasury yield goes down, well, inflation in terms of demand should go up when in fact the opposite happens. And as we go back here into the 80s and why the 80s matters so much 
is simply because we are now a global economy. And as time passes since then, we become more in sync. And what do we know? Here you see in red, the 30-year treasury leading the consumer price index down. You see it going into the dot-com bubble and the recession there. Again, 30-year yields leading the CPI down. How about the global financial crisis? Once again, inflation did surge a little bit on the backs of oil prices, but the bond market said no way. And sure enough, led inflation lower. You see that in 2014 going into 2016 as we were facing a global synchronized recession. How about heading into the pandemic? You got it. The rates were falling well ahead above of that and inflation. And today, again, they see the view here is that it leads to a stimulative effect when in fact it does not because they don't understand what drive rates. They don't understand the monetary system because when you constrain the creation of credit in our system, you start to pull back the range of growth. And that's only part of the issue because when you have a lot of debt in a debt-based system, well, you need money to pay on it. In fact, you need money created by new debt to pay on the old debt. And what happens when you invert the yield and money curves is rates come down because the monetary, monetary system starts to fracture on its way to breaking. And it suggests that if rates don't come down and new money isn't created, that something bad like a financial crisis will occur. And this exactly chart illustrates the market doesn't get it because what happens when they invert those yield curves, the banks tighten lending standards, as we can see here in blue, showing the net percentage of domestic banks tightening standards for commercial industrial loans to firms of all sizes. And what happens? Rates go down because the bond market is trying to get new money created to keep the system intact. The problem is it doesn't work fast enough. And sure enough, you see that in global financial crisis, you see that going into the pandemic. Pandemic. Again, every time the banks are tightening standards, rates go down. Here you see it again. We know the situation is going to get much worse and that rates are going to lead the federal funds rate down, which is something Barkin doesn't get. And he didn't give his expectation for interest rates with any specificity. Well, of course not. They never do. And he said central bankers would respond to incoming data. Of course, we know the incoming data is heavily lagged, which is why the Fed is always behind the curve. He said conditions are ever evolving. And so, too, will our approach. So buckle up. That's the proper safety protocol, even if you expect a soft landing, suggesting he has no clue what's about to happen. But one thing that we do know is the Fed is going to cut rates here. Because remember, they always go to a new low. The problem is we've been at zero twice now, suggesting if we get back to zero again, which I believe we will, it will have no stimulative effect. The U.S. and global economy will be in dire shape under that condition. But let's go back to the previous chart. And now let's add the effective federal funds rate against the net percentage of banks tightening standards for all commercial loans. And what do we see here? Notably, the funds rate going down as the Fed tightens lending standards. This time, they're not doing it. Usually, you know, they start to cut because they see the credit mechanisms in the economy start to fail. The banks tell them we've got an issue here and the Fed completely ignores them. So now as we set the stage here that the Fed thinks that you're going to see a soft landing and that your job's safe, let's start to look at what's happening around the rest of the economy as we get into what the real problem that is now surfacing that says bad things are indeed are coming soon. We see car sales slowing as U.S. buyers suffer sticker shock. But one thing that shouldn't be slowing is the rate of growth in your trading account. Because if you understand that rates are going to come down, we have given you the tools here to buy at low positions. We give you warning signs and when you should increase your stop losses. We talk about our CTA Timer Pro. This thing looks at the machine positioning, but we run a historical overlay. It makes this product super unique, unlike anything else out there. In fact, when you understand this, you can throw away virtually all those other reports you're buying because when we show you on our report it gets near historical low when we see our positioning hit minus 100 minus 100 on our fast and slow algorithm that is your cue to get ready to buy and coming this month and i talked to the programmer yesterday he said yes i'll get it done i'll get it done by the end of the month we're going to tell you when those positions flip so you'll know when to buy and he's going to do the same on our momentum timer pro we've identified the highest value signal here on when the tactical indicators flip here again on november 2nd we see the machine position go up we see the technical indicators flip and this 
Turns out right now, even after this pullback, a 12.3% gain in a matter of two months. Again, you don't need sticker shock when you get your reports. You can simply switch over to these. We're gonna make them super easy for you sometime this month. Hang tight and you'll see like many of our other subscribers just how easy it is to make money. We've seen a big reduction in medium and lower income households buying cars, which now almost exclusively go to the top 20% income households. And the way you should understand this when we read this is they're saying, look, there's a money shortage here in the lower and now moving into the middle income households. This is exactly what happens when you see credit creation mechanism get constrained by the banks. It starts at the bottom and filters up. So yes, for the moment, the rich still can afford cars. They usually continue to do that even during a recession. But it's a question now is at what point does the wave of credit mechanism fall through the middle class and put them in a position where they can't afford anything? The new norm for the industry because of reduced affordability. See, normally they call it an issue of inflation, but that's not what it is. They say it's affecting 16 million people. We've lost about 10% of the buying pool, and every day they're losing even more. Again, it's part of it is the access to credit, but the banks aren't willing to do it. So eventually, this lack of money created in the economy slowly filters through. And many people say, why hasn't happened yet? It takes time because we had to work through all this pandemic stimulus. And the next thing you know, at some point, the lack of money, you start to see the economy seize up. And let's see, because the, unless the industry finds a way to get back to more affordable price points, and that's not the issue when we talk about inflation, we will see products that cater to higher income, higher credit quality consumers, because that's who the banks will lend to. And that ultimately limits sales volume. But the reality of the story is, it's not an issue, it's inflation. The issue is back to wages, because we all know that if inflation goes up, but wage growth is going at a faster rate, it's not an issue of affordability. The problem now is they're saying, look, prices are too high, people can't afford them. We need to get prices down. But as many of you have said in the comments, no, the issue is wages. I'm not getting paid enough to keep up with inflation. And you're absolutely right. We see that here as we look at the consumer price index in blue against total compensation. This is average hourly earnings multiplied by average weekly hours of production and non-supervisory employees. That showed in red, both on a year over year rate of change. Now, what we see here is for a two year period that the consumer price index was largely outpacing wage growth. So even though people were making more money, well, their hours work were being trimmed. It wasn't keeping up with inflation. And for two years, American consumers have suffered. And now they're just starting to see the early signs of getting ahead, but it's too little, it's too late. There's a reason auto sales are slowing. We're seeing this contraction in credit start to hit the middle class. And this is a problem because as it moves through the middle class, you're gonna watch the US economy grind to a halt. In fact, we're seeing signs of in the US home purchase applications as they fall this week, including that of Christmas as the NBA's overall index of mortgage applications, which includes both purchases and refinancing, decreased 10.7% last week, the most since February, despite the fact that rates are down from there and even though rates have fallen almost 8% in October and helped stabilize housing demand, a sustained decline in borrowing costs to much lower levels is probably needed to put the housing market on a better trajectory. Again, we're searching for answers here, and that's the problem is you know, when you read these articles, people don't understand what it means to contract the creation of credit in the economy. Lower rates are telling us that growth and inflation expectations are indeed headed lower. So you're seeing signs now. The central bankers still think the soft landing is possible. The auto market in trouble, housing market in trouble. And what does all this mean? Well, it comes to the manufacturing sector sector. Here we can see, and this tells us bad things for U.S. workers are indeed coming, and it is not a good sign because this indeed is the biggest threat that we have. As manufacturing PMI, this from, of course, at now 47.4, again, from the ISM, which is considered the gold standard of reports. There is no official PMI report by the government. 47.4 means contraction over the prior month as we continue to see new orders and backlogs go down. And that's not a good sign because what do we note in the past? When backlogs and new orders decline, what happens? You have workers standing around. At some point, the bosses start to say is, 
why are they on the payroll and then it's time for them to go the U.S. manufacturing sector continued to contract this from the ISM, but a slightly slower rate in December as compared to November. Companies are still managing outputs appropriately as order softness continues. Demand ease, and that's not what we we're expecting to hear in a soft landing with the new orders index contracting at a faster rate, export orders essentially flat, and the backlog of orders climbing back above 40% but Phil feels still fairly strong in contraction territory. Of course, we note that panelist companies maintain production levels month over month and continued actions. Here you see to reduce headcounts in December, primarily through layoffs. So here you have all the signs that the U.S. economy, the U.S. worker is in big trouble. And this is coming this year because we're going to see in the first quarter more and more people hit the unemployment line and that's not going to go well for the economy or the central planners or the political elites in any form. And here we can see the employment series in December now in contract, uh, contracting again for the third straight month. This is at 48.1, suggesting that the employment levels from the manufacturing sector, which will get, of course, an update on the non-farm payroll report on Friday, this is indicating more layoffs in the manufacturing sector, new orders contracting now for the 16th straight month and the backlog of orders contracting for the 15th straight month. The only question becomes now, at one point do we run out of backlogs and the new orders are insufficient to keep pace with the level of employment? And this is interesting because we talk about, of course, Barkin at the Richmond Fed. Well, how about this? If he would looked over to his neighbor at Philadelphia, what we see is a current new orders index shown in blue against a four week moving average of initial claims. And what we can note is when new order demand declines, that means more people hit the unemployment line. This happens over and over again. It's just like clockwork. And what did we see? This, of course, in the recent regional Fed survey from Philly, big collapse in new orders, suggesting that the initial claims data, which we'll have tomorrow, of course, and I think over the coming weeks and months, are going to head even higher. This is going to tell us that the labor market is nowhere near as strong as the political elites have told us. And what validating that is the U.S. job openings. This is a job openings and labor turnover survey. Quits and hirings ease as labor market cools. In fact, if demand was there, we should see this number go up. But vacancies decreased to 8.79 million from an upperly revised 8.85 million the prior month. Of course, this has an issue because hiring declined to the lowest level since July of 2020. And layoffs edged lower, at least for now. Because one of the challenges here is everyone is bulled up on the U.S. stock market. They're piling in the U.S. equities. They think the next bull market's coming. We have U.S. investors, retail investors, foreign investors all want to buy U.S. stocks. And if you look at the correlation between the Wilshire 5000, which is a total U.S. stock market, against the Jolts survey in blue, it suggests the U.S. stock market is likely to head lower here, which would have a secondary effect. So we're already going to see people hit the unemployment line, which is a problem. Then the stock market starts to go, and I'll show you why that matters in a worse way. The data illustrates a labor market that is starting to bend under the weight of elevated borrowing costs. After reporting troubles in expanding headcount throughout the pandemic, many employers are now scaling back hiring plans, though without resorting to outright job cuts. Well, not just yet, but that is indeed coming because what we can note is the consumer price index in red as it heads lower against the job openings and labor turnover survey in blue. As we see demand go down in the form of CPI, what happens? You need fewer job openings, and sure enough, we see that in the dot-com bubble the global financial crisis and look now so we know a decline in cpi means the jolts come down means indeed equity prices are soon to follow here and of course, what that means is if equity prices come down as we come back to the Wilshire 5000 price index in red, now overlaid against advanced retail sales in blue, this shown on a year over year rate change. And this means not even the rich can keep the economy going. What happens is as the equity market goes down, the wealth effect goes away. Next thing you know, retail sales continue to fall. We know when that happens, more layoffs hit the retail sector. In fact, we're already hearing evidence from retailers that the holiday season was below expectations expectations. That's not a good sign. It means more people are going to hit the unemployment line. The problem is getting over there. Well, that's not good either. 
as unemployed Americans are being forgotten in a strong job market, forcing them to drain, of course, their 401ks to survive. As researchers who track unemployment benefits say if the U.S. faces a reckoning if the nation falls in a recession, which many economists still expect, the number of people applying for recurring unemployment benefits hit a two-year peak in mid-November, backing off only slightly since then, suggesting it's taking people longer to find work. And one of the problems is some states do not inflation adjust their benefits. This is an outright frightening scenario where we're going to see an increase of layoffs, an equity market come down, and those even on unemployment, which is meant to be the safety net, are not going to have the income they need to pay their bills due to high interest rates and high inflation. It's going to lead to a massive contraction in demand. And that, my friends, indeed is why what is coming this year is so frightening. And with that, I'm Steve Van Meter. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being fans. Bye now.